Hi. You excited? I like the metaphor that Lent is a journey. Now, if it's a journey, we take it to prepare our hearts for the events of Easter. And Palm Sunday marks our arrival at our destination. As pilgrims, we've arrived at the gates of Jerusalem and we're here to celebrate Jesus's triumphal entry into that holy city. As the ancient pilgrims would have sung from Psalm 118, O oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. By 600 AD, we have actually the title of Palm Sunday or Dies Palmarium from the Latin, the day of the palms. Now what's interesting about this is only John tells us that they use palm branches. Matthew and Mark just tell us that they gathered branches. Luke says they spread their garments before him. And this journey that we began with Lent continues through this week. On Monday and Tuesday, we have the controversies and conflicts that Jesus will enter into within Jerusalem. On Wednesday, we will remember his betrayal. Then on Thursday, it's the new commandment that he gives to love one another and also the foot washing in John's gospel. On Friday, we remember Jesus' death on the cross. Saturday is a psalm day. We enter into the morning of the disciples when Jesus was laid in the tomb. Sunday breaks forth with the wondrous event of the resurrection. Hi. Ready to head home? We need to take a look at the text of John chapter 12. Good morning. I just figured since it was Palm Sunday, I had to go a little big, and that's why I went out to the park this morning. I hope you enjoyed the views from Palmer Park, looking down over Colorado Springs with Pikes Peak in the background. It's truly a special place to live, and I'm very grateful for it. My name is David Paris, and you're watching the Caffeinated Bible, and the goal of this channel is to help you to read your Bible in a much more stimulating, informed, and encouraging manner. So if you like this material, be sure to subscribe and give it a thumbs up and let other people know about it as well. The lectionary has two choices of readings from the Gospels for this Sunday, one from Mark chapter 11 and the second from John chapter 12. And I'm going to be using the one from John chapter 12 because we've been going through John for the past three weeks and I would like to keep the continuity in our study with John. So let's read John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Don't be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Context. Last week I talked about the exegetes cheer. Context, context, context. What do these words mean in this passage within this book? So let's look at the context in which John chapter 12 verses 12 through 16 fall within the overall structure of John. In John chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. At the very end of that story, verses 55 through 57, John tells us that the Passover was near and a large number of people had traveled to Jerusalem to purify themselves for the high holy day. While they are in the temple, there is speculation among the crowd. What do you think? Surely he will not come up to the festival, will he? This sets the stage then for the crowds that will come out to greet Jesus as he enters Jerusalem in our story. At the same time, we know that the religious leaders are seeking to arrest Jesus should he come to the festival. 
In the first eight verses of chapter 12, Jesus stays at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And while he's there, Mary anoints Jesus' feet with pure nard and wipes them with her hair. Judas complains about her wasting so much money when she does this, to which Jesus defends her actions as preparing him for burial. A remark that I'm sure would have caused some consternation among the people in the room there, but John just lets it slip by at that. This brings us to our reading for Palm Sunday. We also have to note how this reading is related to the one that we covered last week. In last week's video, see the link up here or underneath this video, we covered the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This actually occurs directly after our reading for this Sunday. And this is an example of how the needs for the Sunday's observance in the liturgical year overrides sort of the chronological order of the Bible. What they've done is they've moved John chapter 12, 20 through 33, the hour has come, to last week. And then they moved John 12, 12 through 13 to Palm Sunday. So they've reversed the order of the reading within the text to make it fit the liturgical season of the year. This doesn't occur at many other places, but every now and then it does. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. The reference here to the great crowds and hearing that Jesus is going to come needs to be understood in relationship to the end of John chapter 11. It ties the two together and it lets you know that we need to understand this story in relationship to the raising of Lazarus. The crowds had seen or heard about the resurrection of Lazarus and they're speculating if Jesus was going to come and observe the Passover in Jerusalem. So the next day they took branches of palms and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now this was probably sung originally to celebrate pilgrims when they entered Jerusalem or entered the temple. There are also two different ways that we can understand this line from Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. The original audience out there in Jerusalem greeting Jesus would have understood what was happening in terms of the fulfillment of messianic promises. Israel's kingdom was going to be restored at that time. However, we read it from a post-resurrection perspective, and we interpret what they are saying there from the perspective of Easter, and we see Jesus as the Lord who will sacrifice his life for ours and rise three days later victorious over death. Notice how John has the crowd coming out of Jerusalem, but in the other three Gospels, they have them going up to Jerusalem along with Jesus. John changes the verb here from going up to coming out for the sake of his narrative. He's told us twice that the crowds are in Jerusalem for the Passover. So it only makes sense that he focuses on the crowd coming out of Jerusalem to greet Jesus. In verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, Don't be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting upon a donkey's colt. Jesus riding on the donkey appears to do two things. First, it tempers the crowd's nationalistic aspirations. Jesus is not riding into Jerusalem on a horse like a conquering or a triumphal king, but rather humbly on a beast of burden. Second, John is explicitly tying this into Zechariah 9.9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on a fowl of a donkey. This Messiah is not the nationalistic one many perhaps hoped for. Rather, he is a righteous, he is humble, and he is bringing salvation. When Jesus enters Jerusalem in this manner, he sets in motion an eschatological challenge. The singing of the crowds greeting him, riding on the colt, all point to a promised Messiah that God would deliver for Israel. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus appears to set off messianic aspirations about the long-promised Davidic kingdom returning to Israel. However, it doesn't play out that way. In those Gospels, Jesus enters Jerusalem on the colt, with the branches being laid on the road ahead of him, as they would for a returning king. 
But when Jesus goes into the temple, he exercises divine judgment upon it. The temple is not being used the way it should be. This then sets his arrest, trial, crucifixion in motion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, in John, Jesus enters Jerusalem with the crowd singing Hosanna. But instead of telling us about how Jesus exercises judgment on the temple as he does in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John moves that story back to chapter 2. Remember, we covered that a few weeks ago. Instead, he tells us about the request of the Greeks to meet Jesus. This is what then sets the crucifixion in motion from the perspective of John, not the religious and political leaders seeking to get rid of Jesus. It is this shift from Israel to the world that sets the Passion Week in motion in John's Gospel. As John 3.16 states, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John wants us to see that Jesus's, and by extension, the church's mission is to the entire world, not one particular nation. The church's mission is transnational and transcultural. And because we're standing 2,000 years after that first Easter, it is also transhistorical. What Israel has waited so long for, Jesus now declares has arrived, but not in the way that they expected. Instead of setting up a new Davidic kingdom, he challenges the religious leaders of his day. And he sets off the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's plan. And that's us. And I forgot to mention in last week's video, so I'll stick it in here. I think the reason why John specifically mentions the Greeks asking to see Jesus is that when he is writing his gospel, we assume it's somewhere between 70 to 90 AD, and he is currently on the western coast of modern-day Turkey, a region that was populated by Greeks and Gentiles during that time, and that's who he's ministering to. So talking about the Greeks asking to see Jesus, and then this is what sets the crucifixion in motion, would have been something that directly applied and would have been very, very important for John's Gentile audience to hear. I just thought I'd throw that in for free. I forgot it last week, but you're getting it this week. So if you missed last week's, go back and see that one. 1216. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written and had been done to him. As in the video on John chapter 2, when Jesus cleanses the temple, John tells us again that the disciples didn't understand what was happening, but they remembered it later after the resurrection. The resurrection then becomes the new pair of glasses that allows the disciples to look at the life of Christ and see things with greater clarity. It gives them a new perspective on what was taking place. Now the picture that all four Gospels give us is that when the disciples were out tramping around the countryside with Jesus, they were often totally confused and ignorant about what was taking place. This is totally understandable. We would have been in exactly the same boat. But what's interesting is that the Gospel authors specifically tell us this in their accounts. This is not how you would go about writing a persuasive account of the life of Jesus. Yup. We got it wrong again and again. It makes them seem like totally unreliable narrators. Why should I trust what you're saying to me? Because you're always telling us that you didn't understand what was taking place. At the same time, they would have realized this as well. They knew the literature of the day. They knew how to argue something. And you don't go around telling people that, yep, you want to believe it. I had no idea at all what was taking place there. The fact that they recorded this in their Gospels, I think shows two things. First, that they are just like us. They were not theological geniuses, just normal people who had a very difficult time realizing who Jesus was. Second, their frankness in this area, I think points out to the veracity of their account. Why would they include their lack of understanding and misunderstanding of what Jesus was doing, saying, teaching them, unless this was their actual experience? Now, the next two verses are not in the reading for this Sunday, but I'm going to include them because they help us to see how this reading 
ties in with the larger context of the passage, John chapters 11 and 12, that we're dealing with here. It helps us to grasp and understand this story in relationship to the raising of Lazarus and the Greeks who are asking to meet Jesus that we looked at last week. John 12, 17. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. And it was because they heard that he performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. Once again, we can see how John specifically wants us to understand this Palm Sunday reading in light of the raising of Lazarus. That's why they went out to greet him. This then links Lazarus' resurrection with Jesus' death and resurrection, which is going to come later on. Lazarus foreshadows that. Now, John is an expert storyteller, and his account of Jesus' life, ministry, and death is tightly woven together. It's like a spider web. You touch one spot and all the other spots of his gospel shake at the same time. This is one example of his skill. In verse 12, 19, the Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Verses 17 and 18 tie us back to the story of the raising of Lazarus. Verse 19 then points us forward and ties it into the hour has come, the story that we looked at last week. Now, in the previous video, I discussed how this closing line by the Pharisees leads us into that story and how it's ironic. In the actual historical context of that day, it most likely reflects their frustration with what was happening. This Jesus character is leading the people astray, and the mention of world in verse 19 is most likely a hyperbole on their part, speaking about the crowds running after Jesus. It's an overstatement. But John wants us to see that there is a second meaning to it. And in the next story, the Greeks will come and ask to meet Jesus. When Jesus hears this, he then proclaims, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Because the world, represented by these Greeks, are asking to meet Jesus, the hour for Jesus' passion has arrived. So what does Palm Sunday teach us? Well, the first thing is, it lets us know that Jesus went to Jerusalem knowing what lay ahead of him. He deliberately chose to go. The second thing it tells us in John's Gospel is that Palm Sunday is tied to the resurrection of Lazarus, which will then be tied to his resurrection and then our future resurrections as well, and also to the mission of the church to go to the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This theme resonates through all these passages here. The third thing it brings across, just like that ancient crowd out there on the road leading up to Jerusalem, who expected the restoration of the Davidic kingdom, that Jesus would sit on the throne as a political leader and restore Israel's fortunes, is something that we need to be very wary of. That is not what Christ is about, or the church. It is not about one particular nation or one particular group of people. It is a mission that goes to the entire world. We need to realize that and live our lives in accordance to it. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of great ideas and material that I will remember as soon as I'm done this video, just like the disciples did back then, but I'll leave that to another day. If you find these videos helpful and useful for your personal understanding of the Bible, please subscribe and tell other people about it as well. And also give it a big thumbs up, or as a student of mine coined the term, thumb up it. Until next week, may the peace of the Lord be with you.